<laughs> oh, there's Brian. Hi, Yana. Good morning. Jerry, when, when we get done, give me a call, okay? Yes, sir. I'm thinking Las Palapas. Ooh. Okay, sounds good. That's a good choice. Well, thank you. That's my buddy's restaurant. I know Is it's it? clean. Yeah. <laughs> we got the uh, margaritas to go there during this. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. He just started yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yep. Well, Bob, whenever you want to get started. All right. So just real quick. Uh, my name's Bob Carroll. I'm one of the co-chairs for the HR Roundtable, along with uh, John Mankovitz, uh, if you can find him in the screen. John, say hello. Thanks for coming on. Yes. And uh, uh, we got a really big group here, and I think Jessica and I talked the other day, and Correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica. Did we book a little extra time if people want to hang on and ask extra questions? We didn't, but I we have the time if you guys want to stay and talk more. Yeah, with so many people, it might be it, it might be necessary. Um, so just look real quick at my background. I'm the I'm the executive vice president at Permanent Solutions Labor Consultants. Uh, we handle labor issues, HR issues, employee engagement issues. Our our whole goal is to give employees the best uh, experience they can have in the workplace. And this topic obviously is a hot topic. So I got wind that Ayana does a fantastic job doing a presentation, reached out to her and she agreed to do it. Um, I do have some guests on here also who are familiar with the topic and I hope that they speak up uh, when they have a chance. And if you have any questions, I think the best thing to do would be to put them in the chats so that we can answer everybody's questions. Um, and on this topic, I've done this before, Ayana, I, I don't know what your experience has been, but they go one of two ways, either a great conversation or crickets, and we don't want crickets. We want people to talk. We want this to be a really good, hard-nosed conversation and uh, you know, speak with a lot of realism. And uh, Ayana, I'm not gonna, uh, other than your name, I'll let you introduce yourself, your background, what you do, and uh, run right into your presentation. How's that sound? Sounds good. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thanks, Bob and Jessica, for the invite this morning. My name is Ayana King, and I'm the owner of Maximum Communications, LLC. Um, my business has two wings. One of them is a lot of heavy marketing consulting where I do a lot of social media coaching and content coaching. But the other side of my business, um, which has always been there, but has really grown over the last month or so, um, is diversity, equity, and inclusion discussions. I never call them trainings, and here's why. I never, when I work with clients, I work with a lot of um, private clients and organizations. And um, it's very important for me to have relationships with my clients who know that this is ongoing. This isn't a one day workshop, a one hour workshop. I'm gonna get a certificate and now it's on and I know what I'm talking about. Um, when you're talking about diversity, equity and inclusion in the workplace, this has to be an ongoing conversation. Um, you will never arrive. I love to tell people that I don't call myself an expert. If you call me an expert, I'm not gonna stop you. <laughs> But I don't call myself an expert in this topic because I call myself an emerging expert. I will always be learning about this because I too have biases. Um, so I'm really excited to have this conversation with everyone this morning. Um, I hope that you will use the chat box. Um, Jessica and Bob, I hope that you can help me feel these as I'm going through the slides. Um, I will say that when we're talking about unconscious bias today, for me, when I put on a presentation or a workshop is what I like to call in discussion, um, this is only part of the discussion, okay, because you have to have a basis for understanding diversity, equity, and inclusion first. Um, so I'm going to assume that we all know something about diversity, equity, and inclusion or we would not be here. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and screen share and let's get started. Um, you got to let me in, Jess. You're good to share now. All right, let me 
just a second here. Um, and can everyone see my screen right now? I'm assuming. There we go. So today we're talking about unconscious bias and how it affects us all. I just want to go over a quick agenda about the things that I hope we'll be able to touch on today. I know there might be questions, but we're going to talk about unconscious, yes, but you still are accountable. We all do it, but why? And then we're going to spend some time talking about microaggression, um, because I believe microaggression is really one of the barriers to equity. Um, and if you don't know what equity is, it is not equality. A lot of people use the terms interchangeably. Um, and sometimes it's hard in words to verbalize the difference. So I want you to just take a picture or take a look at this um, illustration right here. And you will see the difference between equity and equality. So equality being on the left, equity being on the right. And honestly, when we have these conversations about unconscious bias, um, our bias is the barrier to equity, which is, in a nutshell, it's everyone having the same opportunities. It's if we're all in a game together, we all have an equal shot at winning, okay? So what is unconscious bias? Well, it's bias that is unsupported, it's unfair, and it's inherent, and we'll talk about that part in a second. It's the first thoughts you have when an image or a person or um, maybe even a situation come to mind. It's those first thoughts you have automatically. It's the snap judgments we make when we see people who are different from us. All of that is unconscious bias at work. So we all do it, we all judge unconsciously, but why do we do that? Because I do it, you do it, there's no one on this line who doesn't. So that's one of the first barriers that we have to get past, is really understanding um, that it is something that is inherent. And we're gonna talk about that, but we are all susceptible. So unconscious bias happens automatically. It's often based on past experience. And for many of us, it's learned behavior. It's really responsible for othering. That's unconscious bias at work when we do that. It's deep rooted, um, it's ingrained. And so we have to do a lot of work to untangle some of this. And so I've been calling 2020 really and truly the year of accountability. I really feel that. Um, I feel like it's the year of accountability, but I also feel like it is the year of awakening. So a lot of us are wrestling with a lot of stuff that's going on internally. Um, we're asking questions for the first time maybe. And some of those questions may be uncomfortable, but I'm gonna challenge you to sit in that uncomfortable place because that is where empathy lives. And in order for us to get to a place where we understand diversity, equity, and inclusion, forget about the workplace for a second, just in our communities, okay? We have to tackle this deep-rooted issue that we have with unconscious bias. So this author, Ma Malcolm down here said, Malcolm Gladwell, my little thing is covering it here, but he says the giant computer that is our unconscious silently crunches all the data it can from the experiences we've had, the people we've met, the lessons we've learned, the books we've read, the movies we've seen, and so on, and it forms an opinion. That is exactly how it happens. Everything that you have been exposed to over your lifetime sets you up to have these really um, quick judgments. We have to be able to make quick judgments sometimes because our brains are just filtering so much information. But over a lifetime, we have, and what we will put into boxes based on our experiences. This is what we're doing all the time. From the time that we really could see with our eyes, right? From the times we could hear, from the times we've been able to learn. That's why unlearning unconscious bias which I don't know that you can really unlearn it in the way that people think they can, um, is really difficult. 
So remember we said that unconscious bias is unsupported. It's unfair and it's inherent, right? It's a lot of stereotypes too. But I want to land on inherent for a second. When you think about that word and you think about what it means, then you can begin to understand why it is so difficult for us to have um, true equity and equality both in the workplace and in our communities. Inherent means belonging by nature, habitual, intrinsic, built in and conditioned, native, ingrained and innermost. That is what we are operating on on a daily basis. So I want to stop for a second because we have a lot of conversations, especially me right now, just in the nature of my business and what I do. But when we're talking about unconscious bias, first of all, I want to say that um, it doesn't just happen um, with race and ethnicity, okay? It happens with gender. It happens in the LGBTQ community. It happens with people with disabilities. It happens with age. There are a list <laughs> of diversities in the workplace and in the world that are really um, negatively impacted by some of our unconscious bias. But I want to say this specifically because our times are calling for more racial and ethnic unity and awareness and really um, I'll say collectively, not even just um, ethnic, racial, ethnicity, all together, right? There's this push for that. And we need to have conversations about race and ethnicity in order to move forward. And what I'm going to tell you is that, especially if you are in a position of leadership and you cannot get comfortable with talking about race and ethnicity, you really have to get um maybe some coaching on how to do that. You need to read some books because if you are in leadership and you cannot address this issue, you will lose faith and you will lose respect with the people that you support and the people who you serve. And all of those people not, may not be black and brown people, okay? So that's what I need everyone to understand as we're having this conversation. You have to be willing to have the conversation first. So let's talk about unconscious bias at work and how it shows up. So a 2009 UK experimental study revealed that job applicants with majority culture names, think Mary, Tom, Catherine, okay, were 74%, 74%, okay, more likely to receive a callback than those with more ethnic names, Ayana, Hakeem, okay, Jose, even though their qualifications were identical. So I want you to understand that when we have professionals in the workplace who don't understand this, this is how we get wage gaps. This is how we get um, organizations that have little diversity and little understanding of why it's important. Um, and again, if you're in an HR role, there really has to be some type of system in place to help overcome these barriers. Because again, we just talked about how this is intrinsic, right? It's part of our nature. It's not always something that we can help, although we will work to be better. So if you're on LinkedIn, and I am, because that's my favorite platform, experts have a way of looking at profiles to find out whether or not they want to um, engage with you and recruiters especially if it's even worth it for them to reach out to you. And one of the things that they will tell you, LinkedIn experts, right, is if you see a background, like this geometrical shape here in the background, if they don't have a background picture, that's a red flag. Second red flag, if they don't even bother to put a profile picture up, move on, okay? That is what we have been taught by LinkedIn experts, okay, for a long time. But what I'm here to tell you is that many people, many people will not put their profile pictures up because they don't want to be automatically judged. They want recruiters, they want prospective employers or even connections that they wanna make to look at their skill set first. And that's pretty sad, but that is the reality. What I'm gonna say to people who are on the line who are nodding their heads, because some of you might be, about why they don't put their profile picture up there, what I'm gonna ask you to consider is why in the world you would want to be considered by someone who only 
really had to be tricked about who you were in order to look at your profile picture. So there's a lot of work that we have to do um, within our organizations, but also within ourselves, okay? Because we also have a culture where we have learned um, to accept some of this behavior. And I just told you, this is the year of accountability. Um, so it starts with us. So I want you to think about that next time you're surfing around on LinkedIn and maybe you decide you're not gonna connect with somebody because they don't have the profile picture. I want you to consider that. The other thing I want you to consider is taking this test. This is a test um, that was put together by some researchers, um, many from Harvard, not all of them from Harvard, but from these universities. And this test is an implicit test, Project Implicit. And you can take different tests based on sexuality, skin tone, religion, weapons, weight, age, race, and ethnicity, okay? I am going to implore you to take this test because it really does um, reveal some things about us that we may not have known about ourselves. I've taken the test and I will tell you that I was surprised about one test in particular because um, I consider myself to be as unbiased as someone could be. I think I am very thoughtful in my approach to how I um, interact with people, um, but I have my own biases. And when you take this test, I'm going to ask you to take it with an open mind and read the results with an even more open mind and consider that maybe you have some work to do. I know I did, and I'm doing that. So let's talk about microaggression because microaggression shows up more than we like to talk about um, and maybe more than some of us even know. So let's first talk about what microaggression is. So microaggression is a comment or action that subtly and often unconsciously or unintentionally expresses a prejudiced attitude toward a member of a marginalized group such as a racial minority. Microaggressions um, on the giving side are often unintentional. It's not like these are overt actions or comments, okay? Um, They are often meant to be a compliment. Um, People are often oblivious when they have offended someone. And on the receiving side of a microaggression, many people who experience microaggression, especially if you um, experience microaggression on regular ba- on the regular basis, you will begin to ask yourself if you are being extra, if you are maybe um, maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way, maybe I'm being too sensitive. This is how a microaggression shows up because it's so subtle. So we're going to get into microaggressions for a second. What I like to do in a second here too is stop screen sharing because. There usually comes a time when there's questions about microaggression. So Bob, maybe we'll keep going and then try to hold some of the questions to the end. Um, you let me know, cause I'm not really looking at the time. So. We, we got one question so far, so keep going. Okay, so when we're talking about recognizing microaggressions, what is a microaggression? We just talked about it, but what does it look like? How does it show up? So I'm gonna give you some examples. So sometimes it's remarks about religion. So I'm going to pick on Christians for a second, only because I'm a believer, okay? And as a believer, sometimes very well-meaning, we will, in the workplace where we shouldn't anyway, um, but we will tell people how they should believe, how they should behave, even though we know and understand that they practice a different religion and belief. That is a microaggression because what I'm telling them is my way is better, your way is not. That's how it shows up in religion, okay? That's one of the ways it can show up. What about in the workplace when we're talking about unwanted and unnecessary comments and assumptions about culture? Mm -hmm. So I love to talk about this one because I'm a black woman, okay? And hair is a big deal for us, all right? So, By now, everybody should know. You're not putting your fingers in anybody's hair. You're definitely not going to put your fingers in my hair. It's rude, okay? The other thing is, 
asking about hair, um, especially when you're not friends with somebody. Now, of course, this has nothing to do with people who are friends in the workplace. And I have many friends that I've taken from one workplace to another with me. Um, and they have the freedom to ask me a lot of things because we have a relationship. But asking people about their culture, their history, their roots, their hair, why is it different? Why do you, it's a microaggression, okay? I love to talk about an experience that I had in corporate America that I'm sure was very embarrassing for the person on the giving end because of how I responded. But at one point, I put my hair in what's called kinky twist, okay? Black women change their hair a lot, not all black women. Um, but this particular week, I had taken the time to put some braids in my hair, okay? And when I showed up to work, a supervisor went to great lengths to stop everyone she could find and literally send them to my office to look at my hair, to ask about my hair. How long did it take? Is it my hair? How much did it cost? All of these things, okay? Microaggression. Obviously, they didn't know that. And at one point, she invited the COO down to my office who said, hmm, that's interesting. So how do I take, hmm, that's interesting, number one, right? Because now you've been putting me um, on the spot all day long in an office where I'm in minority anyway, okay? And then the second that I changed my hair, he sought me out to tell me how sophisticated I looked. So I want you to think about that for a second. How you would feel if someone told you your culture, the way you show up is not professional. I'm not talking about clothing. I'm not talking about speech. I'm talking about hair. Microaggressions show up in the workplace all the time. They leave the person on the receiving end feeling embarrassed feeling ashamed sometimes, feeling angry, and they leave the person on the giving end, not knowing why all of a sudden their coworker is cold to them. This is why we have to get this right. This is how we have to understand what microaggressions are so that we can combat some of the stuff in the workplace. Because I'll tell you that for most of us, um, we, COVID, you know, notwithstanding, but most of us are in the workplace and with our coworkers, more than we're with our families at home. We want really great working relationships, okay? Whether our communities um, are diverse or not. And so in understanding some of this stuff, we can kind of cut down some of the barriers that keep us from having the kinds of relationships that we really want with our coworkers. So a study okay. said that 64% of women say they experience microaggressions in the workplace. Um, there are a lot of ladies on the line. I'm sure all of you have a story. Um, of course, I say again, it's not just gender, right? It's not just um, race and ethnicity. But the fact of the matter is, 64% of women say they have experienced microaggression in the workplace. Another study revealed that Black women say they, they experience microaggression on a daily basis, on a daily basis. So again, I'm going to tell you, this is why we need to understand unconscious bias. Because what happens is when people feel othered at work, they leave. And when they leave, they talk, okay? So if, <laughs> if that's not incentive enough for you to understand that, I don't know what else is. The other thing I'll say about having these kinds of conversations, if you wait until you are having an issue in the workplace, to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, to talk about unconscious bias, to talk about empathy and allyship, you are already late. You have already had trust that is eroding in your company, and now is the time for you to really step up and do something about it if you want to gain trust and respect back, because all of this affects your reputation. So I just want to read you a couple of did you want me to stop for a second, Bob? Uh, yeah, I know we did have a question that tied in with what you were talking about. Maybe we can okay. answer that one now. Okay, go uh, ahead. Uh, and hang on. So it came came from someone that says, "How can we be curious about differences without being without it being a microaggression?" Mm. In other words, coming from uh, say say a white person's point of view, and we really want to learn. Mm -hmm. How can we have those conversations? without it being construed as a microaggression. 
So let's keep going because I'm going to address some of that. Awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to address that. Okay. That's a good question. And I'm not sure who asked that question, but you really asked it universally because you're not the only person right now who's asking that internally. So thank you for that. But we're going to address it. So I just want to read this really quick. These are some real life um, experiences that people have had in the workplace. These are all from BuzzFeed. This person calling himself DYMB says, at my first job here in the U.S., we were asked to introduce ourselves to the training class. I excitedly said that I just moved here from the Philippines with my husband. One of my coworkers asked if I was a mail order bride. So let me say something. We all have that funny guy who thinks he's funny in our office um, that we don't know how to respond to. I have had this happen, I'll say in the last year, something similar, not like this, but a microaggression that we all laughed off and it wasn't funny. It was super inappropriate, but because we don't know how to be allies, um, the person who is doing this, and I'm gonna call this a microaggression too because they think they're being funny, right? This is the funny guy. Um, we have to be able to address it. And so what we really have to have a conversation about outside of unconscious bias is how we empower people um, not just a person on the receiving end, but allies around to step up and step in because that'll never let that happen again. I know what happened with me um, and it won't happen again. So we have to be aware and we have to have allies who are willing to step up and say, that's not funny um, because the funny guy has been getting away from it, uh, with it for a very long time. And I just told you this is the year of accountability. Here's another one. I'm an Indian American and on a fairly regular basis, I get asked if I'm a doctor or if I work in the medical field. Now, some people automatically, you know what they said? What's so bad about that? Automatically, I know some of you did. What's so bad about that one? Well, the fact of the matter is, not all Indian Americans are in the medical field and don't want to be. So here we are typecasting again. This is what your profession is based on your ethnicity, really? Based on your skin color, what is this? This is microaggression and this is how it happens. And it doesn't always look how you think it looks. So I just wanna play this quick video. I'm not gonna play the whole thing because you know it's two minutes in length and there's a little bit of language here. So I'm not gonna pay, play it long, but I'm gonna play it long enough where I think you can really understand if you don't already, what microaggressions are and how they, um, how they show up in the workplace, how they show up in society really. And hopefully you'll be able to hear this. People who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh, just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while. No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland. Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean. Uh-oh. We're rendering here. A lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just playing that. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the rest of the same. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. Uh, mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Can be shopping at so you get the idea there. Bit by mosquitoes every time. So you, you definitely get the idea there. Um, some people get bitten more than others, right? It happens for some people more than it happens for others. And you saw how it showed up. If I can count on one hand, how many times I've heard you're so well-spoken. Why would that be a compliment for me? Should I not be well-spoken? So these are the things that we have to think about because microaggression does not just show up okay with our coworkers and with our friend groups and in our community it shows up with our prospects it shows up with our customers and clients 
So what do we do about it then, right? This is what everybody wants to know. How do we combat unconscious bias? We can start by listening. Listen to other people's experiences. We can include, expand your groups. I know people who have worked in offices for years and they don't know the person down the hall. We have nothing in common. Really? In 30 years, you haven't found anything in common? Think about some of these things by including, okay? By valuing, seeing what someone else has to bring to the table, forget about their name on the resume. If you're in HR right now, I'm gonna tell you, if you are not already practicing blind resume reviews, you are behind. You are behind. We just talked about microaggression. We just talked about unconscious bias. We just talked about a study from like 2009. What do you think it is in 2020, okay? Um, we have to get a hold on this so that we can actually allow people to show up as themselves, okay? And we can value what they bring to the table. People don't even get to get to the table because they see your name on the resume and they decide you're not qualified. By engaging, get to know people. Listening is great, but now that I've listened to you, maybe now we're developing a friendship. Maybe now I'm gonna ask you. Maybe now my friends, who I've had for a while are comfortable asking me about allyship, are asking me what they should have done in certain situations because they've been engaging with me this entire time and there's trust built there, okay? So what everyone wants to know, how do I know if I've said something offensive? The truth of the matter is you might not ever know. The people who you work with your customers, your clients, your friends, your family, they may not tell you when you've been out of line. They may just wring their hands and be done with you, okay? That's the truth. That is where we are in 2020. You've heard about cancel culture. You've seen people's businesses in a matter of moments crumble. This is why. We have to get this right. A lot of small businesses cannot afford to get it wrong. Knowledge is power, okay? There are some things that you can do on your end because what we're not gonna do is make it someone else's responsibility to tell us how we should conduct ourselves. You know, we get on this good internet for everything except for the stuff that really matters. So I'm gonna tell you, go find some books, okay? Watch some videos, watch some movies, watch some documentaries, talk to your friends, Get out in your community, learn about people. This is how you understand what microaggression is and then it starts to come up right away in yourself and you recognize it. There are a lot of wonderful books out right now. Um, I have the second one here, I'm almost done with it. It's been phenomenal, this bias of uncovering the hidden prejudice. Um, you can get a lot of books. I know Amazon last month was giving away audiobooks on um, unconscious bias, because this is where we are in society, where we need to understand it, and people are willing to forfeit some dollars just so that people can get some understanding. So I'm going to tell you, educate yourself. If this is important to you, go do some work. There's lots of information out there. You don't have to be an expert. You have to be an ally. You have to be able to step up and want to know um, where you can make some changes. Because I'll tell you, if we can get this right in the workplace, where we are, again, outside of COVID, most of the time, we take it home with us. We teach our children. We teach our spouses. We teach our community. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. That can be heavy sometimes. I know. But it's important. And I want you to understand that the time for us sticking our heads in the sand is over because what happens is when people leave, I am telling you, they talk. I built a business because I didn't fit, okay? I built a business and now I get to talk about the things I should have been talking about where I didn't feel comfortable talking about them. So I hope that we'll have an opportunity to maybe ask some questions. Um, I hope everybody feels comfortable enough to ask some questions. And again, I know that this was really focused today on race and ethnicity, 
but we have to get this right in every area. We have to get this right in every area. Um, the LGBTQ community, it's 2020. Why are we just now um, passing legislation so that we can't discriminate? That's sad. It's really sad. Um, but that is the reality. And so what I'm going to challenge you to do, and I just, there's a lot of us on the line right now, so I don't want everybody to speak up, but by a show of hands, how many of you would say that, and, and no judgment, how many of you would say that you are naturally empathetic, naturally empathetic? Meaning like you, you just, some people just are that way and some people aren't and it's okay if you aren't. So I want you to look around at everyone who raised their hands because this is why I love doing this kind of work. Because when you can find the people who are naturally empathetic, you almost always have also found an ally in your organization. You just have to help them feel empowered um, to speak up because it's not easy. Bob? That was awesome, that was Ayana. Awesome. Ayana. I, I want to re reiterate something that Ayana started off with, and that was admitting her own faults. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you that are on this call may have been at one of my uh, unconscious bias presentations with the chamber, and I started off the presentation the exact same way. Every, and she said it perfect, everybody on this call has unconscious bias thoughts that, that happen and occur, and most of the time they don't even know it. And, you know, I started my own personal journey. I grew up in the city. And I thought that I knew more than I did. I really did. It wasn't until I was working EMS in the city and actually going into strangers' homes and realizing that even though I thought that I knew the city very, very well, I didn't know how fantastic some of the families were in the city. You know, I, where I grew up, we had the same problem in the 70s with fatherless homes and my father was a Detroit police officer that stuff carried into my head and it stayed in my head until I got actually into the EMS system working in a city and really starting to get to know the people in the city and it was just a fantastic experience for me and I discovered unconscious bias at the time and it's been a, a never-ending journey a never ending and I'm learning something new every day. And Ayana, I think you would agree. You're learning something new every day, I'm sure as well. None of us have this nailed down as a perfect science, yeah. but it's that quest to learn every day that makes a huge difference. And I would also like to point out that we're sitting here with, I believe two chambers, right, right Jessica? Yep. Belleville and Southern okay. White. In our chamber alone, I believe we have three people to do. I do it. Ayana does it. And is Sherry Watkins on this call by chance? I don't think so. Uh, we all do unconscious bias training. We have the resources right in our business area to help address everybody's needs that need this training. I mean, look at healthcare. Healthcare was mandated to go through this training just recently. That's a huge task to accomplish. And uh, I don't know, you just, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I always hope that, um, you know, this can be so uncomfortable for people, but if we can push past that and have open conversations, that is how we build community. It really is. People, honestly, um, I do a lot of training with executive level, like C-suite folks. And what I have found, especially after George Floyd, is people really just need permission to say, I don't know. I don't have the right answer. Um, I feel horrible about this, but I don't know what to do, but I am committed to learning and doing something. That's the right answer. <laughs> like, that is the answer. Um, so we have to start to have these conversations. And I'm so glad that we're having um, this conversation with chamber folks because we see each other. We see each other. Um, and so when we see each other, we need to see each other. We need to see each other. Um, yeah, we have 40 uh, people on this call right here. That's 40 businesses impacted in yeah. the Downriver and what is it, the Van Buren Chamber? And uh, Belleville Jessica, area. There's 40, Belleville. 40 yeah. businesses affected right here. Yeah. Now, if all 40 of the people took the information they learned from the call here 
and spread that message exponentially it's going to spread very quickly but i think there's another thing that needs to be brought up uh ayana if leadership doesn't believe in this why would they bring it into the workplace and is it going to be effective absolutely so um just in working with organizations if i don't have buy-in at the top you know there's enough money to be made that i don't play games i just don't there's enough money to be made for me to go somewhere to people who are serious about it so if it doesn't come from the top i don't even work with i i get to say no because it's important to me and it should yeah. be important to you um and quite honestly again if your company is going through some turmoil right now and you don't have leadership that understands it what will happen is They'll come in and they'll do diversity training or whatever they need to do. And you know what will happen? You will train people to leave. And when they leave, they will talk. That's what yeah. happens. Uh, I, I mean, let's take something recent, for example. And I like the way you did the show of hands. And if it, I hope everyone's brave enough to do it. How many people heard of Juneteenth before 2020? But there's a lot who did. A lot of right? people didn't. Yeah, right. A lot of people didn't. I didn't hear of it. And I, I've been doing this training for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. I was on a call with a gentleman that's written two award-winning books in another state. Had no idea what it was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's just a great example of learning new things every day. Yeah. And uh, for the people that don't know what it is or didn't know what it was, it was actually, it, had, it did have something to do with the uh, freedom of slave, freedom of the slaves, but it, what it actually was was down in Galveston, Texas. They were the last group of slaves to be notified, and they start, they weren't able to celebrate in public, so they had to go to the churches and go to their own private areas to celebrate it. But it and expanded years later. It was years later. Yeah. after they had been emancipated like that's the that's the kicker right there because they wanted to finish a crop that that's exactly right you, you're exactly right i am but years later now here in detroit in our area this has been actually on the books since the 80s yeah. and we're just hearing about it yeah. so there's a lot to learn there is a lot to learn um and people can feel really overwhelmed with there being a lot to learn but the goal isn't again like the goal isn't to be an expert overnight the goal isn't to be an expert period um the goal is to learn the goal is to not just learn head knowledge but to really learn and understand it from within because again that's how we can change the communities around us um so does anybody have any questions specifically about maybe microaggressions, because I usually have some questions about microaggression. Was this a microaggression? Is that a microaggression? Speak now and forever hold your peace. I got some on the, the chat here. Hang on a okay. second. Uh, already asked this one, what's the best way to, oh, this person had to jump off and wanted the video, Jessica, but, uh, uh, what's the best way to handle the situation when you notice your supervisor needs diversity and inclusion training? And uh, can I give the start to oh, that, yeah, Ayana, okay. and let Already you uh, end it? Okay. I mean, the first thing you should be able to do in any business, if you have a quality uh, company that you're working for, is go to HR and have a discussion. That's what they're there for. Uh, you have to know the culture of your company. If you don't feel comfortable, um, maybe there's somebody uh, – in executive leadership that you have a relationship that you trust, but you do have to, you can't let it go unchecked. If you're experiencing those kind of feelings in the workplace, eventually you're going to get burned out. You'll end up being a statistic. You'll end up working somewhere else. And every business wants to retain employees, good employees. So I, HR definitely is the first place to start, but Ayanna, what else can you add to that? Um, I'll just add to that, that, when there is an issue, especially um, if it's someone who's in a leadership role too, I think leadership has to move right away and be very transparent in whatever actions they took. And 
in a lot of cases, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, the only right thing to do is part ways with that person. And what happens sometimes is that we have C-suite folks who are, um, they've been in positions for a long time. They have a lot of clout, okay? Um, and businesses don't want that fallout of having to part ways with that person. But I will tell you, they hurt themselves down the road um, because you've just lost trust with everybody in that downline because they just saw that you, maybe you didn't reward this person for their bad behavior, um, but you certainly didn't make it safe for the people who were on the receiving end of whatever it was that that person was doing. Yeah, and John, you, from a legal perspective, uh, obviously if someone's got uh, those kinds of feelings and uh, they feel their supervisor needs this kind of training, obviously that's leaving the company at risk as well. I mean, what would you say from a legal perspective? I, I think you nailed it when you originally said you go to HR first, you know, go up the chain of command as high as you can go, whether it's HR, uh, senior management, CEO, and then once you can't get above that chain anymore, that's when perhaps I'd be given legal a call to say, okay, do I have claims that I can perhaps bring against that individual or the company? <laughs> One area that would be interesting just to hear from you, Bob and Ayana, and thanks for speaking today is what types of microaggressions, uh, unconscious bias are you seeing in a work from home culture now? And how has your training changed to adapt that? Mm. Um, you want to go first, Bob, or you want me to go? My training's changed immensely for anyone that was at my uh, uh, the one I did for the chamber, uh, I had a whole show involved with the training, and, which I can't do from behind a computer. Um, Topic-wise and, and, and content-wise, it was still the same, but nothing beats getting up in front. And, I, and the first thing I do is just like Ayana, I, I will freely admit that I've had some racist, sexist, you know, I've judged people on the way they look, the way they dress, you know, I freely admit that and I start that out and it's, it's not just for me to get that off my chest. It's to get people comfortable to speak. And it's a lot harder to do that on a conference call like this. But when they see the seriousness and they see it's coming from the heart and they see that, you know, these things have happened to me and I've had to go on a personal journey and I explain that journey. It frees people up to speak a lot more. It, it is a little more difficult to do it online though. Um, and for me, you know, um, so I told you in the beginning, diversity, equity, inclusion was always a part of my business, but I will tell you, um, unless I was giving a workshop on it, I was getting very little calls about diversity, equity, inclusion until all of this social unrest happened. And now like my phone won't stop ringing. Um, and I came from the senior living industry. It's an industry that I love deeply, um, but we have issues there. So what happened was I wrote an article for um, a large senior living publication where I talked about the industry and um, their need for diversity, equity, inclusion, and just like, you know, we've got work to do. And just, I mean, I'm telling you, just overnight, um, folks were really calling from the senior living industry to say, we need to have this conversation. We need to have it now. How do we have it? Um, but the other part of that too is, and Bob, this may be your experience too, but also I had organizations that called panicked. We need to do something now. Can you give us a one day workshop? We need certificates. Um, and I would politely invite them to seek out someone else to help them. Um, because again, how committed and serious are you if you wanna spend a day to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion so that you can get a certificate? Um, so I'm going to implore everyone who's on the line, if it is serious for you, um, if it is um, serious for your organization, then get serious about how you want to address it and how you want to move forward. Because this isn't a one-day workshop and now we all have arrived. No, I, I, I am absolutely correct. This is something that has to be ingrained in the DNA of every workplace. Yeah. If it's not in the DNA, you, you, you're throwing away money. Mm -hmm. You got you mm -hmm. you got to mean it. You got to want it, and you want 
to employ that on your employees as well. This isn't a, a training for supervisors. This is a training for everybody in the workplace. And you know what I've seen coming out of the diversity workshops, the unconscious bias workshops, is a group of workers that work closer together than they've ever worked before. I've seen higher production, lower turnover, um, better conversations. And I think that's the biggest thing because uh, when there's a lack of communication, that's a business killer. I don't, mm -hmm. you have to have communication to run a good business. And this actually opens up communication when done right uh, in ways that uh, I didn't see before we started doing it. And I'll say too, just really quickly, I don't know if we have any other questions, but I'll just say that um, I just wrapped up a workshop with a client, with an organization, um, and the CEO said something to me that just like really sat in my heart. And I knew like this is, these are the kind of clients I wanted to work with. He said to me, he said, you know how um, other companies go after innovation? Like they want the best workers, they want the best ideas. Um, that's what they want. And I say, yeah, he said, I want my company to go after being anti-racist in that way. This is a young white guy from the UP and he gets it. He gets it. He, he knows that he has some work to do. He knows that their executive leadership team needs to be more diverse. They understand that they don't understand the LGBTQ community. Um, they understand that they don't understand gentrification and what that looks like in the city of Detroit where their business is situated. Um, and I just feel so fortunate to be having these conversations with folks who are really here for it, truly. Did we have other questions too? I feel like I feel like we, we do. can talk about this all day. So I don't hey, see uh, the hey, chat. Uh, I, I do me a favor. I just put my contact information down. Uh, okay. Oh, I sent it to Jessica. I was just Jessica, about to say you only can you, can, yeah, I'll can you copy, copy and paste that to everybody for me? I will. <laughs> and then uh, Ayana, put yours down and maybe we can get... Uh, um, okay. uh, Sherry's information out as well. I, I think that working from within our own uh, group and, and providing the help that people need is a great opportunity. Uh, I, I know you're learning the same lesson I learned yesterday. <laughs> you you do more than one line. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody have any questions that they feel comfortable. I mean, the whole goal is to ask questions in front of other people and start taking away that fear of asking questions. Um, until we can do that in our workplace and then in society, we're really not going to make much change. So we got to start somewhere. Does anybody have any questions that they want to throw out there? Elena did. Um, Elena says, when we say the wrong thing, what is the best way to apologize and move forward? I'm so glad you asked that too. Um, the best thing you can do is apologize from the heart. Um, really just say, I'm sorry if I offended you. I'm not even gonna tell you what to say because there is no script when it comes from the heart. But when you have made, when you have really put your foot in your mouth and you understand that you've done that, go immediately. Don't let embarrassment keep you from an opportunity that really could turn into a relationship and a teachable moment for the both of you. Don't let that happen. Don't let ego and um, embarrassment keep you from saying, listen, I thought about what I said. I'm really sorry I said that. It came off the wrong way and I'm gonna do better. Do you know how, how far that would have gone for me? I probably wouldn't have a business right now. <laughs> if somebody would have said, you know what? We did not do or say the right thing. Um, we're really sorry and we're committed to changing that. Do you know what that would have done? and what it will do for somebody just for you to give an honest apology. Um, we will all make mistakes, especially when you're trying to figure this stuff out, especially. Um, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Don't be afraid of that. Be afraid of staying the same. Be afraid of that. Be afraid of that. You know, we have kids that are watching us. And they're gonna ask you where you were in 2020 and what you were doing. Well, you just said about kids too. I mean, that's something that hits hard with me because uh, when, when before I started my own personal journey, I have, I have a 24-year-old, and I can tell you, you know, from the heart, 
that I said and did things around my 24 year old when she was young that I regret even it wasn't blatantly racist it wasn't blatantly sexist but it was things that were passed down from generation to generation that at the time just seemed like normal conversations right yeah and then I've learned a lot since then so we've got to watch our children in hearings what's that remember we said that unconscious bias is inherent it's absolutely it's part of the fabric we got to do a lot of work to rip the that off. The big difference, Ayana, uh-huh. that we have now is our kids are asking us questions now. They're seeing what's happening on the news. They're, they're, they're paying attention. Yeah. So we got to be pre- prepared to talk to our kids or what's the next generation of business going to look like? Definitely. Um, so Elena, someone just asked. Yeah, go ahead. Someone just asked, uh, also, do you feel like until we are – we are more uh, educated. We should silent. We should be silent, or should we step up and talk and have conversations, even when they are clunky? I think you should speak up. Um, again, you don't listen. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to read one book to know when somebody says something out of pocket for you to say that was wrong. What you're really asking for is permission to speak up and you don't need permission to speak up to do the right thing. The other thing, cause right now what we're getting into is empathy and allyship. And I love that conversation too. But the thing about allyship is allies have skin in the game. They do period. An ally has skin in the game. Um, speaking up takes courage. So yeah, even though you, it may be clunky, you don't have to give somebody a history lesson. What you can say is, um, I'll give you an example of what happened the other day. So I was in a coaching and I was telling them a story about, I just read, this guy said he went to a dinner party. Um, They shouldn't have been at a dinner party anyway, but they were, they were at a dinner party. And he says that someone started to make a racist joke. And he said, instantly, um, he said his heart was in his throat. He said, because he knew where it was going, it was already getting uncomfortable. And he said he had a decision to make. Um, Should he speak up or should they just talk about it after the fact, right? Because he said, this is what happens. And he said a phrase that I had never heard. He said, this is what white alliance is. He said, what happens is, especially when we we are in groups together, and this is a white guy. He said, when we are in groups together, we will not correct one another. And especially if there are other people of color there, he said, we won't do it. He said, so he felt, um, he felt scared even to say something. He said, but what he did was he said, um, you know, I can tell where this is going. I don't like it. So I'm either going to leave or we can stop the conversation. And he said it soured the whole mood of the dinner party. He said that it was so, um, tense afterwards and that people were physically like, you know, they were just tense about it. Um, but he said he knew he did the right thing. And then after the fact, and some of you are going to nod your head because you're going to understand after the fact, so many people came to him and said, that was the right thing to do. I'm so glad you did that. Let me tell you what that is not. That is not allyship. That is not allyship. Don't come to me after the fact and tell me good for you. That does not help me. It lets me see who you are. It lets me see who you are. So when we're talking about being an ally, you got to have skin in the game. Yeah, it's uncomfortable to speak up. It is, but you know what else is uncomfortable? Being the target. So for all of my people who raised their hands when we talked about being naturally empathetic, I want you to understand that. Skin in the game, that's what it is. Somebody else had a question too. And that, test you, that test you gave, Ayana, that was the Harvard test? Yes. If you look up, if you just Google Harvard implicit bias, um, bring it up. You know, I'm, I'm very transparent in my coachings that I do with folks. And I let them know that I took a test on, um, on weight. And I was disappointed in myself because, again, I, I think of myself as a very fair, fair person, very unbiased person. And I had a slight preference for thin people and even though it was slight it might as well have been heavy because that's how I felt about it um and so you know what I did instead of being upset about it and instead of like retaking the test because you know I didn't have the right timing whatever I thought about how I feel and I thought about the things that I think about 
and I'm committed to doing something different because I don't want to have a slight preference for anyone. Another true story that I share is that I had my own biases about white guys and pickup trucks. Funny story. My husband is a white guy who drives a pickup truck. <laughs> I just didn't see him in that way. <laughs> so our biases are something else, you know? Mm -hmm. I did not see him in the way that I saw other folks, but that's what I was doing. Um, so I've committed to, you know, over the years, like I need to change that about myself. Um, so I just want you to know, like I talk about this stuff deeply and passionately, but I have my own issues that I work through too. I think somebody else had another question about how to address unconscious bias. There's a few more in the chat. So I was going to tell people, you know, hang on, we'll keep answering those questions. But if anyone does have to log off for time reasons, I'm going to, I'm recording this and we'll email it afterwards. So if anyone's got another meeting to jump to, um, feel free, but we're going to keep, keep the conversation going if you guys still have time. And thanks anyone who has to get off. Thanks for being here. This is such a good conversation. I, I love it. And there they go. <laughs> <laughs> I know I knew we had 1030 on there so I didn't want to hold people but you know we'll keep it going um that's why I said we've got it recorded and we'll answer those last few questions um what else was on there we got went out and about and I hear something racist sexist etc I've acted as if I don't understand the joke and asked the person to explain repeat repeatedly yeah I've done this because instead of making things a harsh call out it makes the person telling the joke a little more uncomfortable uh, when someone just doesn't get it. It's funny. I do that with my kids, too. Good for you, Allison. That's a good one. Yeah, it yes. Is. That's a good way to address it. The other thing, too, is um, when people talk about being allies, we, we hear about loud allies, right? But I want to encourage you that you can't expect someone who's an introvert to all of a sudden start shaking their fist. Sometimes what allyship looks like for them is when you pack your stuff up, they pack their stuff up too. When you leave the conversation in the room, they leave with you. Sometimes that's what allyship looks like also. I really like that example, Allison. I'm gonna use that. I hope you don't mind. That's a good one. Did we have any other questions? I think we still um, had a couple to, more. Anybody wanna ask a question out loud? Or, or... Um, this is Medina Atchinson. I ask, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I asked a question in the chat. I'm not sure if it didn't come through or not, but somehow it got skipped. Um, I, um, I feel the need to speak um, positive things over people and compliment them, especially when I see somebody um, who did a great job with something, um, just, you know, led a meeting and did a great presentation. I'm always complimenting. Um, the example that Alana, Alana, I'm sorry, you, Ayana used. Um, forgive me, I have a, a unique name too. I've been called all sorts of things. Um, I always want to compliment people. So when I can tell that somebody is nervous and say that they're leading um, um, a supervisor's meeting or something, I compliment them. I said, "Wow, great meeting, uh, very well spoken." Um, I don't want to be perceived as, you know, a micro aggressor. And so, you know, I'm just looking for some, you know, I want to compliment people. They love it. Um, people um, look to me um, because of that. I, I often tell uh, people that, you know, we need to hear good things, not all the things that we've done wrong. That's true. So you just... Um... You just listed a couple things that we talked about during the presentation or what can you do instead and one of them was listening and one of them was valuing another one was including. Um, so the only thing I'll say is specifically, um, specifically, I, I won't even say it's just race. I'm going to say economic status. Sometimes when you tell people from different economic statuses, um, um, Maybe they grew up, maybe they didn't grow up um, with a silver spoon, okay? Maybe they had some economic hardships coming up and you know that about them for whatever reason. When you say to that person, you're so well-spoken, we hear it a lot differently. We hear it a lot differently. I hear it a lot differently when I give a presentation and someone tells me, wow, 
you were really well spoken versus I really love that. I really love everything you said because there's a difference there. Um, I can't always tell you what the difference is, but I know it when I hear it. I know it when I hear it. Um, another one that I have heard is, I didn't know you graduated from college. Well, first of all, you didn't ask me. Why would that be a shock to you? That is microaggression. And it comes from people having this unconscious bias of they have a picture in their minds about who I should be based on their own experiences, right? And they bring that to me. And so when I don't fit in their box, they have to tell me I don't fit in their box. So they really think that they're paying a compliment when it's really a microaggression. Does that make sense, Medina? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I get microaggressions too. I, I can tell you one for a 48 year old white male that's irritating. Uh, you see me dressed in a polo right now. Uh, I, when I'm working, I'm usually in a polo shirt. But when I meet with clients and they, or attorneys or it doesn't matter who, and I'm in a suit and tie, and I hear the words, "You clean up nice." That's I, I mean, one. come on, That's I'm I, I'm the exact same person I was w w when you got along with me with my polo shirt, right? Yeah, another <laughs> one. You know, another one that we hear, um, like with age, is right around fifty. People start asking you, "You thinking about retiring?" You ready to retire? I've been guilty of that. Um, but it's a microaggression because we aren't asking young people about their retirement plan and some of them aren't saving a dime, <laughs> okay? So, and I'm 41, nobody's asking me about retiring. I'm trying to be done in five years. <laughs> so that's another one. I, I know, again, we're focusing really heavily on race and ethnicity because we should, it's important. But I'm telling you that there are microaggressions across across the spectrum here. We're talking about age, uh, again, um, what the LGBTQ community experiences um, is really sad. And I have just really committed to understanding um, more about that community and being better there. You know, um, oh, there's another letter. I don't care, learn it, learn it. I don't care if it's 26, le 26 letters of the alphabet, you learn it, you learn it. Because what does it cost you? Um, to show someone respect and to make sure that you are operating um, with dignity in mind. What does it cost you? That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> okay. um, did we have any other questions? I think we got everybody. Thank you, Elena. So I wanna know how many people, well, everyone's got their video off now. Uh, how many people were outside of their comfort zone in this training? Mm, that's or this, question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Elena, not training. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion. Or Ayana, I, I apologize. <laughs> but how many people uh, were taken outside of their comfort zone a little bit today? Nobody? That's good if you weren't, and it's okay if you were too. I know that sometimes when you do this, and Ayana can probably can test to it, uh, it takes time to open up the, the barriers to really get people to, to talk. And that's why I like the way Ayana puts it, that it's not a training, it's not a one and done thing. Mm -hmm. It takes, a, a, I mean, it's not, you're going to have to do this as part of your DNA and your company. Yeah. You're going to have to do it all day, every day. Uh, and not just at work. It's something you want to carry with you in your personal lives as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I put my email address in the chat. Um, but if you're on LinkedIn or on Facebook, um, I have a Facebook page too, but Jessica knows it's not my favorite. I love LinkedIn. <laughs> so if you're on LinkedIn, um, please connect with me there. Um, it is my favorite platform. And we're just having the kinds of conversations, even on LinkedIn. Um, I've been really pleasantly surprised about um, just the number of high level professionals I have seen make statements about 
it is time for change and we are committed to it. It's, it's been very refreshing. I'm telling you, like, if I didn't have my own business, now would be the time to go back to work <laughs> for the right folks. So um, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions or not. I'll tell you what, uh, if they do have any questions, uh, is there any, just email Ayana or, or myself. If I can't answer it, I'll, I'll forward it to Ayana. Ayana, I yeah. hope you'd reciprocate it to me. Absolutely. Uh, we want to make sure everyone on the call gives all the answers they need. Uh, I'm very glad Jessica recorded it. This is the one that should be recorded, Jessica. Yeah, I agree. And so, like I said, I'll uh, so, email it out to everyone, and then I can even put both of your contact info in that email. Yes, and this is going to be on LinkedIn and YouTube? Yep, I'm going to upload to the YouTube page, and LinkedIn only allows a 10-minute clip, so you'll get a peek yeah. on LinkedIn. Yeah. No, you, you can send it from YouTube to LinkedIn. Can you? Yeah. I'll look and see if that works. Yeah, you I can, can walk you through LinkedIn it. LinkedIn does not like it. They won't share it a lot. That's what I thought. You can you can do it, but what you do is put that first 10 minutes in there and then put the put the uh, link for YouTube, put it in the first comment. That's what I'll do. You can do it there. Um, Allison had one more while we wrap up, I think. She says, when someone feels that a fellow employee needs microaggression addressed, should they approach the employee when it happens or should they approach management after the fact? So I have, I have a feeling about this, like, um, you know, I don't have an HR background. So my response is different. I don't always feel like the right thing to do is to go to HR first. In some circumstances, yes. Um, but I feel like, especially if you are an ally, for instance, if, if Krista and I are friends and we're sitting next to each other at the desk and I say something out of the way, um, to someone else and Krista overhears it, she's my friend, she's my coworker. I would hope that her first inclination would not be to run to HR. I would hope that what she would do is say, hey, Ayana, you said something to Ashley that was real messed up. Um, this is why it was messed up. You should probably go and apologize. And hopefully that person will go and approach that person um, and make it right. I don't always believe that especially right now, this is cancel culture. People are losing their jobs, they are losing their businesses. I feel like when you are in a friendship with someone and you know their heart, hear what I said, and you know their heart, I think you should give them the opportunity to make something right. Because again, we're all gonna make mistakes. It's not always my first response is to go to HR. Had that been my first response, I probably would have been going to HR all the time. Um, but I'm telling you that I had friends the places that I worked. Um, they were not always allies. They weren't. Um, but I did have friends there, and I knew that. Anybody so, else have anything else? Yeah, I would also agree with that. When we do our management training, our regular management training, our diversity training, we and we're talking to the employees, we do encourage the employees to talk to each other first. If yeah. it starts to escalate in the littlest, littlest amount, we want them to go to HR because yeah. we don't want escalation in the workplace. Right. Right. Well, again, I just want to say thanks everyone for the opportunity. Um, I hope that some of the stuff that we talked about today sits with you. Um, it can be heavy, you know, especially, so I do a four part series and whenever we talk about, um, microaggressions, whenever we talk about unconscious bias, it is pretty heavy. So sit on it, sit on it and take that test, take that implicit bias test. Um, and then no matter what it says, keep working, keep working. I've got to run, Jess. I've got to run, Bob. Um, thanks again, everybody for, I won't, I'm not telling everybody else they got to go, but I have to go. So <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. And yeah, I hope that you'll connect with me on LinkedIn. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Ayana. You're welcome. Yes. I, I, I just also would like to say, I think that when we do these, especially when we're starting out, people are afraid to speak their mind. There's a lot of things that uh, I know people want to say, questions they want to ask. I, I think I shared the story when I did... Uh, the first one I did with the chamber 
maybe maybe I didn't. But when I really got my first real big lesson into how I misjudged an entire culture, I was working I uh, was working with management with the union issue, and it was about seventy five percent black, twenty five percent Yemeni in this facility, and the two groups did not have the greatest relationships. So we were brought in to try to bridge the relationships. But I didn't know the Yemeni generation as well, or Yemeni group as well. So I, I admit, I went in with a lot of preconceived notions that I was completely miseducated on. And it happened to be during the month of Ramadan, which is a big, big deal. And when I started asking them questions, you know, why do you do this? Why do you do this? I mean, they choose certain routes during Ramadan to help them get through the day because they're not eating. And, and it's just, you know, I, I had enough doubts to ask the questions. Well, what they did is they actually brought me into their circle and they educated me. And the education was just phenomenal. And it was to the point where I was the only one that they invited at the end of Ramadan into the break room where they were allowed to have a, a, a breaking of the bread, if you will, a big uh, a meal and a party. And they allowed me to come in and be part of that. And just them allowing me to do that showed that I really listened. And, you know, we didn't agree on everything that we talked about in the workplace, but we did agree that the learning experience, because they ask questions about, you know, frankly, uh, uh, my life too, and what I've been through. It was just a phenomenal eye-opening experience that I wish everybody could go through, because I had pictures in my head. I mean, we're during it was during wartime. They would show me pictures of their family at home with with swords, and of course, I. At the time, I'm like, I don't want to see this. This is this isn't right. But what I didn't know is those swords have representation of the family tribes, and it's a, a piece of pride for for the, the Yemeni people. And what a great thing that I, I I wiped that completely out of my mind. When I see those photos now, I know that that's that's like me getting my daughters and my wife up to the uh, photographer and getting a family photo taken. Because I'm proud of my family. So, uh, I mean, it was difficult to ask him some of the questions I asked him because to me, I sounded ignorant, but to them, they were happy to share. Does that make sense? So, if anyone takes anything out of this, I would say ask questions. Stop being afraid. Any other questions before we wrap it up? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> yeah, I think we're done. Again, uh, my email, Ayana's email is on here. On, uh, will the comments show up? Yep, they both did. And like I said, I'm going to email this uh, recording out to everyone, and then I'll have Ayana's and your contact info. Yeah. And I think we're going to have a lot of lot <clears throat> more businesses that are going to be required to uh, – in fact, I was talking to uh, government, uh, a government registration system – yesterday and uh, a lot more government entities in the federal level are going to have to go through this type of training as well so this is something that's going to be pretty big for a while now if i i, I believe it's, this is going to be required uh for the long term i have a quick comment i'm fran babbage i'm going to be honest this year i'm a governor elect and i'm on this we are part of the chamber, but I think this would be good to my convention of, of Kalanis people, not just business people, but just in general that everybody gets this training. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what was your position? What, I'm governor elect of Kalanis, the oh, service okay. organization. I'll be Michigan's person on top for a while. Start That's why I said we have we got three people that I know of in uh, the Downriver Chamber. I'm not sure about the Belleville Chamber, but we got plenty of people to take care of our own here. And uh, 
I, I, yeah, that's, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, see, I'd be interested. We're, we're doing a virtual convention, and I'd love to have a, a session on this, you know, on, on unconscious bias on that. Yeah. So I was supposed to do it at Michigan HR Day, and it was canceled because of COVID, which was a real uh, bummer to me. Uh, little did I know that it would escalate so quickly because uh, yeah. the George Floyd incident didn't even happen when it was canceled. Uh, well, we're, we're, in midst, just, we're in the midst of making a four-day convention on Zoom. <laughs> we're going crazy right now. In fact, governor, our officers training right now. In fact, I have to do one. We're doing three of them today. So we're doing everything on Zoom. We're getting good at Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Well, you got our, you got my email. You got Ayana's yeah. email. Uh, let us know. We'll, we'll be glad to help you out. Yeah, thank you. Hey, and like Ayana, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Uh, if you're not connected with me, I would love to connect with you. Same here. And then the Chamber's got a page on there too. So if you don't follow us on LinkedIn, give us a follow. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, next meeting, do you want to set a topic? That's a good question. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> we, what topic? We almost forgot. <laughs> Any idea from the group on a topic for next month? We usually let the group pick. <laughs> Someone's got to have one. I was about to say, how do you, <laughs> this is such a good one. Well, how do we top it? Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, exactly. Well, something's going to happen between now and next month. <laughs> well, uh, Jessica, how about we just chat about it? I was about to say, if anyone has ideas, shoot me an email, um, and then we can talk about it, Bob. Yeah. And for all you out here, uh, I, I just co-chair the thing. I like to have guest speakers. I don't want to be the only one speaking on these things. So if you have an idea and you want to present, uh, we open it up to uh, guest speakers. So you'll, you'll but, get an email from me today. So if anyone's got an idea, send me an email. Yes. <clears throat> all right. I think we can call it a day. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. You guys have a great day.